Welcome to the Experience Focused Leaders Podcast. My name is Alex Shemalenko. I'm CEO and founder of Relate To, and we are on a mission, both with the podcast and with Relate To, to bring the most important ideas to life. And how do we do that? We do that through amazing, immersive, engaging experiences that move your organization forward, move your customers forward, and move us as a society forward. So if you love ideas, if you love bringing these ideas to life, stick around. Also, at the end of the podcast, we'll reveal how you could potentially be a guest speaker on the podcast as well. Let's get started. Welcome to the Experienced Focus Leaders Podcast. I am privileged to introduce you to one of our mentors that relate to and friends, an investor, but really just a cloud pioneer that we're privileged to have occasional chats with. And we wanted to uh, share the the insights from one of these chats, just like you're you're hearing um, uh, almost like an inside track here with Steve King. Steve is a former CEO of DocuSign, but really a five-time CEO with many exits uh, to boot and um, you know now sits on boards of um, exciting companies. But I, I think um, you know without further introduction, Steve, tell us a little bit about your background and you know how you've come to pioneer a, a few uh, cloud-based solutions, not just one, especially in the enterprise content space. Well, Alex, it's great to be here. Um, and, and you're right, I am a friend of, uh, of yours, of course, and relate to, and uh, really been excited to watch the progress along the way. And we'll continue you know, to be on the sidelines, rooting, rooting for success, which I am absolutely convinced will, will come or is coming. Um, Boy, you know, I've been in Silicon Valley a long time, so I'm not sure how far back you want me to go. But, uh, you know, I, I moved here from Seattle back in uh, the mid 80s because I wanted to be a part of this. You know, I, I was, was reading about, um, you know, the, the emerging companies uh, in Silicon Valley. And and in particular, you know, I was in kind of content and managing content and and was excited about the idea of of taking you know this paper content and converting it into digital form so it could be more easily managed and information uh, could be retrieved um, uh, much more easily and and the power and the knowledge in that information could be leveraged uh, more easily and you know I was with a company called uh, well, Ziff Davis which still exists and uh, at the time it was owned by the Ziff family and they were in computer publishing and uh, also computer uh, magazine publishing primarily, but they were experimenting with online information distribution. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that and um, uh, came came here to Silicon Valley. And, and ultimately what really propelled my career was um, leaving them after they were acquired by Thomson, which is now Thomson Reuters, and joining this quirky little company in Palo Alto called E-Trade. Uh, and uh, I had Heard some friends. Heard of it, traded on it. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. <laughs> yeah, I've had some friends who have, uh, who'd uh, left, you know, Ziff and had joined them and were trying to desperately to recruit me to do, you know, strategic business development. I said, why do I want to work for a broker? And I'm not a financial services person. They said, no, you don't understand. This is a pure play internet opportunity. So this is in 95, 96 and uh, I met with the CEO, Christos Katsakos, who is this very charismatic um, uh, entrepreneur who, who you know, really kind of repositioned E-Trade into a technology company. And he had me convinced in five minutes in, in meeting with him that uh, I should, this is a great opportunity I should join. So in the four years I was there, we grew from a couple hundred employees and uh, 50 million in revenue to... 5,000 employees and a billion and a half in revenue. And uh, so it was a pretty chaotic time, but it was right in the middle of the dot-com bubble. And there, were, because it was so chaotic and the growth, growth was exploding, there were lots of opportunities if, if you wanted to raise your hand and, and take on uh, additional responsibility. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of fast forward through the, the first three years, but the last year I, I, I was asked to to take over an E-Trade Ventures company called E-Offering, where, you know, by this time we were pretty, 
pretty full of ourselves and uh, with how we had really disrupted retail trading, and we were going to do the same thing with investment banking. Well, you know, I had no investment banking background, but I, I was asked to sit on the board of this investment that we'd made, uh, which was supposed, supposedly going to get us into investment banking. And anyway, again, short version, it wasn't going very well, and so they inserted me as. The CEO. So I was an act, first. I was the accidental banker, you know, investment banker, and then I was the accidental CEO. I had no intention of, of being the CEO, but somebody needed to, to come in because he traded made a substantial investment, and and they were not managing it well. So you know, I, I jumped in, and and uh, that really was my first CEO uh, opportunity, and I learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, but uh, it was it was a great experience, and we ended up selling that to our, our primary competitor. And, and at that point, I moved on, joined a, another uh, technology company. So I was ready to, at that point, build something again. And uh, E-Trade had made an investment in this uh, company called Xantas, which was doing uh, uh, archiving uh, of important documents that were being created digitally or converting paper to digital form and, and then storing them in the cloud. Although we didn't call it in the cloud back then, we call it on demand. You know, right. that was, that was a very, that was the buzzword. Term. That was the first version yeah. of, the, of the cloud, right? Exactly. Or, or as a um, service, uh, storage service provider was another yeah. term, but we, we didn't want to really leverage that because we were more than storage. You know, we had the smart platform to, to manage uh, uh, documents of all types. However, as the air was coming out of the dot com bubble, because this is you know late two thousand uh, when I joined, we realized very quickly we weren't going to be able to raise any more money, which was really easy to to come by up to that point, and and that we needed to ensure that we had enough runway to prove we had a beachhead market, and the beachhead market we chose was archiving email for financial services firms for compliance. Mm. There was no real defined market. There was no analysts. You know, Gartner there was no covered. Gartner reports. No, no yeah. Gartner report on that. But having come from financial services, you know, I knew that there was a requirement to do this, and we happened to get a little bit lucky uh, and had some tailwinds. Kind of, so headwinds uh, converted to tailwinds when things like Enron and WorldCom. The Wall, the, the the global settlement, you know, uh, the investment banks on Wall Street, where they were pumping up, um, you know, uh, certain stocks, uh, you know, to to, be, to get more business, basically, because the simple way to describe it. And all of a sudden, the SEC and the regulators and law firms realized the smoking gun in in these cases seemed to always be in the email. Uh, so uh, these uh, financial services firms were very motivated at that point uh, to to get something in place. And we had, you know, one of the advantages of SaaS today is the ease of implementation. Everything's managed by somebody else. You know, you don't have to build infrastructure. And we had we had basically done that and we had optimized for for large financial services firms because our largest customer was Citigroup. We only had a handful of customers, but the largest financial services firm in the world at the time mm -hmm. uh, was our customer. And we had optimized our platform to scale to that level. And, and we became, you know, one of the only games in town with a, with a purpose built platform for high volume email archiving, where you could actually retrieve with accuracy, uh, you know, the emails in the case of the regulatory investigation or, or a uh, discovery request. And uh, so we, I, I spent seven years as CEO of Zantaz and we uh, ultimately did sell that business uh, as well. And, uh, and from there, I, I decided to take a little time off and so that's, that's amazing. So that's the, the Zantaz story is sort of a, like one of the first, you know, cloud successes uh, yeah. ultimately ended up, you know, a, a huge hundreds, multi hundred millions dollar exit. And, right. and then ended up ultimately as part of HP. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. HP. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that I, I find interesting is that that was uh probably much harder, right? Like, like right now, SaaS is known, you know, people are comfortable, you don't need to justify the model, but here you're selling to. 
financial institutions, really conservative. Thank God yeah. there you were a former investment banker, quote unquote, <laughs> right? But it's yeah. it's like it must have been like tremendously challenging to to go and kind of pioneer a solution in an unknown category to such conservative yeah. institutions. What do you think kind of um, allows you to succeed there and bring this company from the brink of you know, collapse to, you know, yeah. such a success, early success and being uh, kind of a leader in the space effectively. Yeah, well, there, there are a number of factors. First, we had a management team who believed in what we were doing. And uh, I still look back on that to this day in awe and wonder uh, about how the team was so committed and, and believed so much that we were on the right track. Um, two, our customers were the largest, you know, our, our initial beachhead customers were the largest financial services firms in the world. And we had access to, to you know, senior level uh, people in the technology groups who were telling us we were on the right track. And then, mm -hmm. as they said, you know, we see everything, right? We have an opportunity to evaluate every technology there is, in essence, that's, that's relevant to, to financial services. And we can tell you that what you're doing is unique. You know, first it's in the cloud, but two, you you've created this infrastructure uh, to uh, to to scale. And as long as you can scale, then we're going to have a, a mutually beneficial relationship. But the second we believe that you can't scale, you know, you've hit the wall, then we're going to have to look for alternatives. So we can, we're constantly motivated to improve our, our platform, to, to scale with the largest financial institutions in the world. And we got a reputation and, and you know, we, we became known on Wall Street as the, the go-to solution when you didn't want to build it yourself. But the other thing, though, that made it hard, it wasn't just convincing the customers, it was actually building it in a reliable way. I mean, you, you don't have the infrastructure that you can rent like AWS or, right. or, or you know, Google Cloud or whatever, you know, today we had to, we were building, specking and building our own hardware, believe it or not, and establishing our own data centers. And it, it was a very capital intensive business and, and very, very hard to manage. And our customers recognized that as well. And they gave us credit for the fact that we were, we were doing a reasonably good job. And, 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 and that's why we were able to, to grow the business the way we did. Now we eventually uh, went to adjacent markets like electronic discovery, you know, for, mm -hmm. for the legal field, that was a big market for us. Uh, we, we saw that that was, you know, a natural adjacency and we ended up making acquisition to, to, to accelerate time to market, you know, and get into that, that market quickly. And, uh, and, and, you know, we had customers who, who prospects who said, no, we'd never do this in the cloud, who eventually became customers once they realized how hard this, this was to do. So, you know, we had market factors that shifted into our favor. We were the only one that was doing it the way that we were doing it. We were building to scale and uh, we had proven that we could do that. Well, this is, this is fantastic. So we've like fast tracked to another CEO gig that you've done. That's near and dear to our heart. And most of our audience knows DocuSign really mm -hmm. well. There's a lot of interesting nuances that you and I were talking about. of like, what made you realize that DocuSign ha had an opportunity before uh, before the rest of the market did, right? Yeah. And it was sort of, you took it from a very rough uh, and unproven space, was a really interesting technology to um, to really kind of establish initial market leadership. So guide us a little bit on that journey, what helped you, you know, see the potential on DocuSign and how you re restructured the company to really innovate on the, on the go-to market, not just pure enterprise, but I think you really were pioneering uh, bottom up and enterprise approaches at yeah. the same time. And I think yeah. that would be really fascinating kind of for anybody going to first principles to understand like what, who were the first companies doing it? What was, what were the challenges? Because when you're trying to do it yourself, you know, sometimes I think we get too caught up in looking at the latest, latest examples, but I think you really learn the most from the people like you who've pioneered a new go to market model. Yeah, but that great question. And, and yeah, as we were talking about earlier, yeah, there's a, a an E-Trade connection there as well, as well, and also a Zantas connection. First, the E-Trade connection. And you know, I when I was first approached about the 
CEO opportunity at DocuSign, it immediately clicked for me because at E-Trade, we were big proponents of elect, the idea of electronic signature because the the way we were growing is app opening accounts as quickly as possible. And we knew that if we could automate the signature process, because you, you know, from opening brokerage accounts or bank accounts, there's a lot yeah. of documentation, lot of and administrative yeah. stuff. Well, we lobbied the state of California to pass the, uh, to make electronic signature legal. Well, that's great for California, but if you've got customers in Texas or New York or wherever, and it, they, the law does not apply to them, then it's really not a, not really that relevant. So it turns out that law was then used as the template for the federal e-sign act, which passed uh, in 2001, I believe. And, and so, you know, I, I was approached about the DocuSign opportunity in 2009 and DocuSign had been around for a number of years. And there'd been, a, there were a couple of other companies that were also trying to make a go of it in the e-sign space. But, but no big companies, no Gartner research on eSign mm -hmm. back then. Um, and so I, I got to thinking, you know, maybe this eSign should just be a part of a, a you know, something else, you know, bigger application. And I, and I was able to do some research in, and use the product and talk to the management team and, you know, ultimately was convinced there is a market here. It was just being done the wrong way by the early incumbents. I mean, some of the early entrants into the e-sign market were actually building on-premise solutions, yeah. which are, you know, just imagine how cumbersome that would be to try to manage the, the e-sign process. And DocuSign was was really the pioneer of, you know, doing it. There were there were others, EchoSign, which was acquired by Adobe, but but DocuSign was, was leading in terms of product development in the cloud. And uh, I, I was convinced that, yeah, there's a market here. It, and this is where the Zantas connection comes in because in the early market, early days of Zantas, there was no market study, no Gartner research. In the early days of eSign, there was no Gartner research. Uh, uh, there were some analysts who were curious, but no, none that were really sizing the market. And then you know, fast forward 10 years and it's a multi-billion dollar market. So, so that was really, you know, what propelled me to accept the offer. And then once I, I got, you know, into the company and started to evaluate what was working and what wasn't, you know, my playbook coming from Zantas was the big enterprise, the big enterprise stuff, right? sale. You know, we had multi-million dollar customers there, but I but I started to look at the at the landscape, you know, not just at what EchoSign and other eSign companies were doing, but also what Box and Dropbox and other, you know, what I call SaaS 2.0 at the time, you know, what they were doing to to go to market, and and I um, really realized that that's what we needed to change. We needed, we had some false starts before I got there, and, and the go to market strategy. But what was really working at the time was that kind of mid market, what Salesforce called, uh, probably still calls commercial. Commercial, uh, and and so we readjusted the investment that we were making to we had this high low strategy we called it, but it really to push more resources down into commercial and even self serve, uh, and and reserve the you know the 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 enterprise sales motion for the opportunities that were that were obvious that were true opportunities. Whereas before you know we were trying to cultivate the enterprise market when it was probably too early when we were having so much success in, in or or you know relatively speaking success in the commercial market why not invest more there so that's that's so, the right, so you changed the playbook from like even though you had some traction you probably had a few early wins in the enterprise and, yeah. and then you said but yes but it's still a lot of hard work it's hand to hand combat and here not we efficient. have it's we have combat. we have here we have momentum we have happy customers we have viral capacity built in by the way we, we start seeing some of the same patterns ourselves and then it's like okay well what how do we make you know if we work with this mid-market segment it's going to keep us disciplined and make the product even more amazing probably right and so then it will help us eventually in the enterprise anyway when we do get there and so you're conserving your resources you're focusing the business but there must have been a big change right at the, especially at the time that was totally unproven and I would imagine every VC 
uh, in the land was thinking enterprise, 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 big deals, big yeah. deals, big deals. So yeah. what yeah. kind of gave you the, what were the, what were the tools that you, you had and the conviction that you had, especially given your past success in enterprise, right? In making that mm. call, is it just the data? Is it um, a belief yeah, that yeah, you by had that to be time, different? Yeah, by that time we had, you know, we built a management team. We'd filled some holes that existed, and you know, we had a, a, a CMO who really um, took the lead in in developing a strategy, working with our board, you know, board members, and other outside uh, resources that we, we could tap. And so we did just didn't. Hey, you know, wake up one day. This sounds like a good idea. Let's go do this. We we put work into it. You know, we did. We let the data, you know, drive our our decision making. And you know, we analyzed past history and sales and realized that you know that this is our growth engine. And and long after I left, the growth engine continued to be you know that that mid market uh, where there's less friction. And lower customer acquisition costs. Uh, and the other thing that DocuSign did, and then and this had just been put in place before I got there, and you know, we continued to leverage it, was, was a beachhead market in real estate. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, referring back to Zantas, our, our beachhead market is financial services. You know, we, we knew we wanted to, to go beyond financial services, but we needed to prove the, that we had something that could could scale that provided value customers would pay a lot of money for and, and, and with DocuSign that being in real estate in addition to you know it's a horizontal platform it's used by yeah. every industry you can think of today but but having that association with the nat with, with the or the partnership of the national association of realtors and having them as an investor gave us some uh you know gave us an endorsement the other thing that we did very quickly is we put a partnership together with Salesforce mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we became a premier partner. We, they became a customer. We had some early wins with their sales team and that, that also uh, helped fuel, fuel the business. So and, you have kind know. of a combination of a horizontal platform with some kind of trying to tap early innovation, early adapters horizontally, but then at the same time, you, you, you know, and you still, I think DocuSign still has specific solution for real estate if you go to the site. So, so that kind of, and, and I think there's some markets where people expect that they're unique or they're large enough that there right. is a specific solution to them. So that's the beach. I got it. Um, now, one of the stories that you told me that that's interesting is, you know, like, and we get, you know, People are coming in, M and A opportunity. This bankers coming, pitching you, etc. All the mm -hmm. time, and you got uh, pitched um, to uh, acquire one of your competitors. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't really know what's going on in these situations, and you know what's the thought process? Kind of why? Why do you invest? Why do you not invest? Like shed shed us some light. It's a pretty well known you know, probably part of the market and um, uh, EchoSign is the, the company that I'm thinking of, you know, like what, you know, it's not past history, so there's nothing sensitive in there. And it would be good to get a little bit of a perspective of a CEO of a potential buyer, kind of how you're thinking about that opportunity and how do you think about it now uh, from yeah. the perspective of go, no, go decisions. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll keep it high level. I don't want to share too many of the nitty gritty details, but uh you know, at Santas, we actually uh, you know, grew our business organically, but we also did four acquisitions when I was there. You know, so uh, and at E-Trade, my job, there was strategic business development. I was responsible for the first two acquisitions the company did. So I'm familiar with with M and A as a as a way to grow, and um, uh, so always open to those kinds of opportunities. But you know, if you're going to evaluate that first. Doing a private to private deal is really hard. <laughs> it is really hard. You know, establishing relative valuations and where you're going to get the capital. Will the other side take your equity? Uh, and and more, are you ever going to be able to negotiate relative valuations to to make it work? So so you know we explored that opportunity and. The, the, you know, for, for 
I believe you know, there are a couple of things that have to be in place for something like that to work because it's so hard to pull off. Mm -hmm. uh, one, there's got to be obvious synergy. But when I say synergy, not, well, we can cut this cost. It's, you know, if we put these two companies together, how does one plus one equal five? You know, uh, and if it isn't really clear, if it isn't going to get you to market faster, plug a product gap, uh, add substantial revenue, get you into uh, customers that you that you aren't into. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're just doing it to take out a competitor, um, you give up a lot. And at, at DocuSign, you know, we were not really in a position to give up a lot back then. And, um, and just, to kind of, I'll, just to kind of, uh, you know, for, for other folks like, I'll share my experience. So at success factors, I was screening out, you know, I was at some point in charge of competitive yeah. analysis. So I was screening out who would we want to buy. And, and so we had a, like a criteria in terms of, you know, is exactly what you're describing. Is this addressing a customer segment that we are not in? Is this mm -hmm. addressing a product category of some kind that we're not in? And is this addressing a geography of some kind that we're not in, especially as you kind of started scaling yeah, up an right. enterprise. And, you know, it was really pretty amazing if you could have had something, right, that was sitting somewhere in Europe or Australia, right, and and happened to have kind of some global presence and validations, but you know you could kind of blow it out as a kind of um, across, across your, you know, geographies. It's a new product uh, capability, and you, you, know, you, know, you might acquire it at a, at a at a discount, and then by the way, it helps you address a new persona um, of a customer or kind of some larger customers in the vertical that you haven't addressed before. So that sort of mind process, I don't like. I don't think it it, it really gets very clearly covered in the press when people talk yeah. about acquisitions. People get cut up in the in the buzz of it and the excitement and the multiples and. And so on, but I, I, it sounds like that's kind of the methodical approach that you were applying uh, yeah. in your analysis as well, right? Exactly, and, and and ultimately, you know, you have to ha be, have the belief that you if if you don't make the acquisition and one of your large competitors does, or a large incumbent who wants to enter the market does, you have to be convinced that you you can. Compete and at Santas, you know, we competed with every large technology company on the planet in that archiving space. Ultimately, we competed with IBM, even though we had a partnership. We competed with HP. We competed with EMC. Uh, we competed with others. You know that that uh, I can't even think of right now. But but we were we were successful. And and I believe that if you're going to sell into enterprise, sell in B two B. You, you need to have a plan, a strategy for, for how you're going to outmaneuver the large incumbents, especially in the beginning while you're establishing your market presence. And um, at, at DocuSign, we were convinced that we had a much better product. We, uh, we had a, a bigger customer base. We had... Um, uh, you know, we, we weren't going to acquire anything that was that was so unique that that it was worth giving up a lot of our equity mm -hmm. and, and and consequently dilution to our investors, you know, to to acquire it. That we were we believe we we're going to go out and compete and win. And if you fast forward to today, DocuSign has seventy percent. I don't know, last time I, I checked, which was quite some time ago, but seventy percent market share by some estimates. So, so DocuSign was incredibly successful in competing uh, in that market with, with others who, who were bigger. And, um, uh, had, you know, ultimately, uh, that's what we, the, that was our conviction and why we, we decided not to, to move forward. And, you know, it wasn't a unanimous thing. It was controversial, but, uh, you know, we, we really, it was not something that, we could afford to do it at that price, you know, at that time. And ultimately I think history has shown history that. History proving you're wrong. Right, yeah. on, that, on that situation. And I think the other thing is like, if we look today, right? Like we definitely I would think of DocuSign in the enterprise world, right? Oh, no question, like, sure. So it's yeah. really interesting that you had to pull back 
right? You know, and kind of focus on that that motion where there's traction. But that's just that was a you know temporary decision, right? It doesn't mean that you said, hey, no, we're not doing doing enterprise. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, no. that's probably a bigger driver of the revenue now. I would imagine typically in right. mature no, no, companies, it's, these you're... enterprise things, right? You're absolutely right. You know, the, the long-term strategy is to own the enterprise. The winner in that market will own the enterprise. And but is the enterprise ready? You know, are we should we d- use more of a bottom-up approach as opposed to trying to force it top down? And uh, a lot of companies, you know, I'd like to say that, oh yeah, we had this brilliant idea, but you can just look at how Salesforce built their business and and you know, a lot of other, you know, SaaS companies that are public today started off with a freemium version and, and selling to individuals and then bundled those into departmental sales and ultimately to enterprise sales. And uh, DocuSign followed, followed that playbook. Well, I, I always feel uh, uh, I, I love chatting with you because you have this pattern matching. And, you know, by the way, folks may not know, but Steve, we met Steve through Alchemist Accelerator, where uh, we were fortunate to have you as a um, a kind of as a co- CEO coach, and and then you know, later you decided to invest after seeing all the awards, which is great. But you've you've kind of had this openness to look. You got to experiment and find you know where where you fit best, right? And then when mm-hmm. we met, we were just you know tech enabled service effectively, like trying trying to like nailing a problem that we found in the documents and presentations world. And I'm just curious, like when you look at, you know, companies either like us or others, like where do you kind of, how do you pattern match, whether it's for investment or yourself or kind of, how do you pattern match? How do you guide these companies to kind of towards that niche to what you found was DocuSign, right? And mm-hmm. uh, when, when it's all murky, right? There's like pockets of success here, pockets of success there. Um, and you can help them find like what's going to be your beachhead uh, mm-hmm. and encourage experimentation versus, you know, versus like, okay, this is our model and that's it, right? Like how, how like what's, what's been some lessons learned from coaching and mentoring CEOs now that you're kind of in that, play more of that role rather than being it, yourself? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I've worked with a lot of other companies, you know, that as an advisor, board member, who have gone through that process as well. And I, you know, it's, for me, it starts with thinking about, you know, I, I'm reluctant to use strategy or strategic planning, especially for, for startups, mm-hmm. but you do have to think through where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in three years? If everything goes close to perfect, you know, ec- execution wise and market factors that are beyond your control, but you know, assume that, that, uh, you know, the markets are, are stable. Where do you see yourself in, in your company in three years? And we went through that exercise at DocuSign after I got there. And, and, uh, you know, the, it, it was really enlightening to, to hear everybody's view on, on where we thought we could be if we executed well or you know, better than well, excellently. And, uh, and and how aligned we were once we, we could spend two, three days in an offsite talking about this. And, and then, but once you've kind of set that big goal, you have to back it up and say, okay, now what do we have to do this year to stay on the path to that goal? Mm-hmm. What do we have to do this quarter? What do I have to do this month? What, what should we be doing today that's going to keep us on the path to achieving this, this big goal that we where we envision ourselves to be, where we'll create a lot of value uh, out into the future? But, you know, you need to constantly revisit that. So I had a process that you know, kind of learned this at, at E-Trade uh, when I was general manager of, of a business there that, that we formed through two acquisitions. But you know, take the time to to think about that and then revisit it every six months with your management team to 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 see have things changed. You know, what have we learned in the last six months? Right. Are the market dynamics different? Um, should we is this really the right strategy to uh, it, you know, or should we be doing something different? And if you if you do that religiously and you stick with it and then you build your planning and goal setting around that. 
the, it becomes, I wouldn't say easy, but the path is more clear and you can, it makes it easier to pivot because you're saying, okay, this is what we thought. Our assumption, it was the best assumptions we could make at the time with the data that we had. We've learned some new things. So we need to shift. This may yeah. either accelerate us to get to where we want to be in three years. It may delay, but uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to make progress. And, and I know, you know, it sounds a little esoteric. I don't want to jump into the, you know, to the nitty gritty. I don't think we have time for that, but starting back as general manager of a business at, at E-Trade and then every other company I've been a part of, even as a board member, I've encouraged uh, the, the management team to do something like that. And uh, it, it, it it really, it's, it works, you know, it's, 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 it's simple. I call it strategy as a process. It's not, it's not strategic planning, you know, a big five-year uh, yeah, effort. Yeah, you're not doing you bring like in consultants some, uh, to handle it. Yeah, you plan. do it yourself. You do yeah. it yourself, you, but you kind of place these like explicit markers. So, you know, Hey, we thought this was yeah. our, and I think that's really, it's like something that jumped out at me. Uh, I think that, you know, really, benefits everyone for, for everyone because i think it's almost life right like you know we are you're not like an inherently evil person because you thought something you know or, or messed up person because you thought something you know six months ago that's now completely wrong right like you kind of knowing what we know knowing who we were back then being you know us being who we are the market being what it is this was our kind of world view Right. Mm -hmm. We rent was this review and then like six months in, here's what we learned and things have changed. We've gotten smarter. The market changed. We've canceled some hypotheses. We've raised new questions. So it sounds like this is almost a manual for life, right? It's not, you know, like it's not a manual, like just for the startups because, you know, you kind of need a big vision for what are you going to do with your life? Right. But, mm -hmm. but, but if you hold yourself to a goal that you were, you know, in like a, a 13 that you wanted to be, you know, an NBA player and just the height, <laughs> the height setup didn't work out. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's just say that, right. Then, you know, how do you readjust that? Right. Like how do you stay tuned, like to maybe the global important themes that are important for you, but um, the realities change, you know, maybe what you like changes, right. Like maybe, with, like what your team is passionate about building also could be changing. So it sounds mm -hmm. like you're providing a like a natural course correction method here, but but still some structure um, along with it. Is that kind of the- I think that's a good way to describe it. it. Yeah. All right. So any other tips and kind of uh, good things you see and like craps that you see for anybody trying to build something new because I think you have really unique perspective where you you kind of you know build business units from scratch but still also like in the early part in particular operated was in the larger structures uh, and so we we at you know in the podcast you know, in general and relate to we appeal to people who want to create meaningful change people that want to create you know pre create and bring to market new products uh, launch new campaigns, and to do that, they need to take risks. They need to get other folks on board uh, was, was um, you know, the joint vision. Um, so what are you seeing of like of the kind of where do people succeed with this? Where do they fail? Where can lessons be taken from startups to corporates and vice versa? Yeah. Also a great question. And I think for me, what, what the first thing that comes to mind is surround yourself with great people. And it, it sounds like a cliche, but it, the reason it's a cliche is because it's so true. You know, it, you, you, you need to be self-aware to identify where your gaps are and make sure that you're bringing in people who are, who are complementary, you know, to your skill set, who are as passionate and committed to the vision that you have as you are, uh, who can articulate that vision as well as you can. And, um, uh, you know, as an investor, I make, especially, you know, when I was making really early stage investments, like relate to uh, a big part of it, probably more than 50% is the people. Like mm -hmm. I, I invested in relate to because I invested in you. Mm -hmm. 
And you. Uh, you know, I realized you were a force of nature and you you weren't going to let the inevitable obstacles, big walls that that you're, you're going to run into get in your way. You're going to find a way around them. And that's that's exactly what's happened. And so so, uh, you know, again, if you're going to build something great, you're going to have to have a great team to help you do it. Well, I'm flattered. I really wish my mom and my my wife and my kids would be listening to this podcast right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, this is so so the people component, and then you know, like like so. Let's say again. Let's take even us, right? Like you were in the enterprise content space for a long time, right? You've seen unshaped categories. How do you combine the the people component with the market component, especially when things are early? And you know, not proven, and the category doesn't even exist, and the product may not even exist in the mm -hmm. way it's supposed to be down the road, right? There's just this vision. Let's say you have a enthusiastic and you know, um, um, you know, empowered individual in charge, but there's still the market component, right? Yeah. And so, how do you think about that? And you know, maybe use us as an example. Like, what did you see where that helped you connect the dots twice, right? Because you've invested, a, a, you know, you know, a, mm -hmm. over over time that, um, you know, maybe the first time and then the second time, like, how do you make those decisions uh, of, 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 you know, on, on, was your own, was your own money, so to speak on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so the, uh, and part of this is, is related to the, to the people part of it is that, you know, you're, you were not sitting in a room, you know, with your co-founder, assuming what the market wanted. You mm -hmm. were talking to anybody you could get a meeting with about what you're doing, uh, what your vision was. Uh, you, you're, you're, then you incorporate that feedback, market feedback into iter iterating your product, you know, knowing that maybe you, you're not going to be able to take you know, do, to convert your product to exactly where it needs to be, you know, in, mm -hmm. in short term. But over time, you you know, you had a, a vision for where it needed to be based on customer feedback. So talking to lots of customers, lots of prospects, people who are knowledgeable about your market all the time, you know, just constantly interacting with the market is, is, is what I, what I've done in the past, you know, when we were, uh, it's fantastic, you know, taking a big leap of faith that large financial institutions would would um, trust what we did. It wasn't that big a leap of, leap of faith because we talked to them and right. they told us what they wanted and it, that if we we could meet those requirements, uh, they they had a need and we would uh, we would be seriously considered. And that that's what happened. It, same with DocuSign. You know, what, let's go talk to the markets and find out you know, what people really need and let's make sure that we're using that to make our decisions, not, you know, sitting in a room, waving arms, you know, convincing each other that we have the best ideas. And, and I've seen that happen. I, I that, you know, honestly, that's what was going on at Zantes when I got there. And, uh, but, but it was easy to do during the dot-com bubble where you're, you know, just go raise, you run out of money, just go raise more at a higher valuation. But now, you know, you got to make that capital last and you've got to build something that customers want and will pay for. And, the, and you need to go talk to them and collect that data to let that drive your decision making. Got it. So what I'm hearing is that, in, especially in the tough markets uh, where, you know, the, the, whether it's the funding for, from internal sources, if you're a corporate thing or external, you know, like investors, um, you know, you don't have that luxury anymore. If you do, it's kind of much more expensive, so to speak. So you need to be more and more customer focused. And so that um, that DNA uh, in anybody who's trying to break some break out something new, focusing in your audience, your customers, prioritizing them, sounds like that's obvious. Uh, but that's not done nearly as much because there's a momentum for this is our technology constraints. This is, you know, this is, was our original vision. We already did six months on the roadmap. Is that kind of the, the mm -hmm. conversations that you have or like, I'm a, let's debate the finer points of the products, but forget if people even use, you know, understand what the product is supposed to do in the first place, or even targeting the right people to, for the product is, right. you know, so, and do you think 
why do you think the people get trapped in this? Is this just kind of they, they get too in love with their ideas? Um, is it just natural? Uh, like I'm trying to scratch my own itch, like I'm, or like I've heard that Steve Jobs did his own things and told the customers, you know, <laughs> this is the solution, and you know, I'm the next Steve Jobs. Like, where do you see kind of uh, the kind of the the cognitive blocks that help smart, very capable people, you know, lead them down the down the astray a little bit? Yeah. Oh gosh, all of the above, you know, and and it, uh, there I've seen more really smart people just think they've got the answer and, you know, don't necessarily want to be told that they're wrong. Uh, and I think, you know, it's human nature to some extent, it, it, you know, it, you don't want to hear bad news. And so you kind of, kind of avoid it and rationalize it and, and uh, that's the worst thing you can do if you're building a business. You, you need the unvarnished, you know, hard truths uh, and then not get discouraged, you know, uh, deal with the brutal facts and, and, and figure out how you're going to use that input to make your product better and uh, find better ways to solve the customer's problems. I love it. And I think this is sort of your, like, wrapping this up a little bit in a philosophical note steve right like whenever i chat with you like i kind of have a sense that you have this energy and vitality and it's it's sort of you bring that to your family to you know folks that you mentor so how do you um you know as an as a kind of as a as a leader of companies going through significant transitions right as an advisor how do you for yourself um kind of build the types of habits that help mm -hmm. you Kind of deal with the brutal facts, right? And yet, you know, I don't, I don't think I've seen you down, you know, or I've seen <laughs> you like negative in particular. You kind of put things in perspective, and I think maybe that's wisdom that comes with experience. But if that's wisdom, like a lot of young younger entrepreneurs, uh, leaders could benefit from that, you know, earlier before they acquired the hard way. What would be your advice and kind of keeping well, that you, you know I, I, you, you can't replicate you know, the years right. <laughs> and, the, and the mileage, you know, that I have. Uh, and, and so I've learned a lot uh, through, through those many years uh, in Silicon Valley. But th the other thing I thought about this a lot about, because I've been, people have described my personality that, that way. Uh, other people have described it that way as well. And I think my early career in sales was a huge help. Because that, that's how I, I started. I never thought I'd be a salesperson, but I, you know, was offered, offered the opportunity and, you know, pretty methodical about how I approach things. So I, I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm not going to be the flashy salesperson. I'm going to be the one who understands the market the best, who understands my product the best, who understands my competitors' products better than they do. And, um, and then I'm not what I learned in, in my early days of sales is don't get too high, you know, when you have some successes, but don't get too low when, when you hit a dry spell, because you will, you know, just kind of manage it and deal with facts. And, you know, I had a pretty successful career in, in, in sales as a result of that. And I just carried that kind of um, uh, roadmap of life, you know, with me uh, through everything that I've done. And, and, you know, in a way, I always say I, I like to be in the eye of the storm, not, you know, on the on the sidelines. Uh, it, you, I, I want to be in there where I can have some control on the, of the situation and make it how figure out how to make it better, not not as an observer. Uh, uh, and so I don't know. That's just it's just how I'm wired. That's amazing. Well, um, very inspiring. So it's kind of Go in the eye of the storm, but stay calm and put things in perspective, whether they're good or, or bad. Um, great advice. Uh, Steve, it's been you know a pr privilege in general and especially today to hear your wisdom. And I hope our audience really enjoys this. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how can people... Uh, get in touch, find you at LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to find you. Sure, yeah. LinkedIn is, is a great place to track me down if, if you're interested in connecting. And uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, 
uh, it's been a lot of fun to uh, kind of talk about the the history a little bit. I don't get a chance to do that much anymore. And uh, uh, congratulations on your success. And uh, you know, I'll continue to to be here on the sidelines, as I said, rooting you on. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Thank you for inspiring us and you know helping build uh, definitive cloud companies that now you know we're trying to emulate as well. So thanks very much, Steve, and um, um, best wishes to our audience. And hopefully they could uh, learn more of the of uh, the stories of from from uh, DocuSign and Zentas and apply uh, some of these lessons in your startups. Thanks. You bet. Welcome back. Alex Shivalenko here. Thank you so much for listening to Experience Focus Leaders podcast. You can learn more about us at podcast.relateto.com, R-E-L-Y-T-O.com. Obviously, we would love for you to send this to people that you know who would be great speakers or just share the nuggets that you took away from this episode with your community on social. And you could learn more about what we're up to on relateto.com. You could certainly connect with me on LinkedIn where it's just very easy to spell my name. You have to have a master's in Ukrainian. It's Shevelenko, S-H-E-V-L-E-N-K-O. Would love to connect so that we can move together the way the world communicates about its most important ideas. Thank you for listening. We hope to see you next time. Bye.